pretty essential for the presence of everyone. So good to look out into the audience and see each and every one of you that are here. I'd like to, as a personal note, make a comment that I'm sure that we've all become weary with this coronavirus that we have been experiencing now and going into our fifth month, uh, the middle of the fifth month. But from the reports that I'm hearing, uh, as far as the nation is concerned, we are still uh, staying on the increase instead of the decrease. And even I heard just, I think, yesterday that China had been relaxing many of their regulations, but now uh, their numbers have climbed again and they're going back under uh, lockdown. So we know that many people, because, and I'm sure we feel the same way, we feel that we've been uh, cooped up, we feel that we have been uh, in, infringed upon, but yet I still want to urge you to never one of them, especially when you go out into the general public to use every precaution that you can because we need to take care of ourselves. We need to do what is beneficial and will, we've been told that we'll help to be beneficial in helping us to not contact this virus. So again, let me urge each and every one of you. And I'm thankful for your willingness to come out and to be here this day that we can busy ourselves at worshiping God of the opportunity to be in the company of one another. So very, very thankful. If you will, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Uh, is it on the screen? I got my monitor on it. I don't see it. Okay. Anyway, turning the Bibles to Mark, the fourth chapter. And I'd like for us to begin reading at verse 3. Jesus doing the teaching. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. But other seed fell on the good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Then let's drop down and look at verse 18. And Jesus given the explanation of the parable. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enters in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Have I got a problem here maybe? Let me unplug it and see. I'll protect this all. I don't know why I've got it on from Wednesday night of this. Sorry for the technical problems. They very well may, may be on my, my end of it. Let me make one real quick check and see if we've got mirroring going on. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm supposed to have. Anyway, thank you very much, Shane. So in the parable of the sower, we see that what we want to concentrate our study on is what we read in the explanation that Jesus gives concerning the seed that fell among the thorns. We see that there are two men that are involved in this world in what we would call, or what I would call, hardcore worldliness, fornication, adultery, drunkenness, drugs. These, these are the things that we would consider hardcore. But I fear at the same time that there are far too many Christians that are engaged in, again, for the better explanation, soft core. In fact, I've heard it worded respectable worldliness. And they're too involved in the affairs of this life. That is truly a form of respectable worldliness. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. We know that we're soldiers of Christ. We oftentimes sing songs that depict that image of us in our relationship with Christ, soldiers of Christ. Well, what is true of soldiers that we are familiar with in our physical, culture, political world is true of us in the spiritual world. We must not get so caught up in matters of this life, although there are matters that we truly have to pertain to, the things that we have to consider and make time for, but yet to contangle ourselves is the word that Paul uses here in Second Timothy 2, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. So that's why I'm saying that so often as Christians, we get too involved in the affairs of this life. And then there, sometimes it's just simply too much love for this present world. Remember, we're told in 2 Timothy 4, if we drop on down to verse 10, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. We well, normally have that think of Demas in terms of him and his relationship to Paul. But there's another relationship that we do not need to overlook. If Demas had forsaken Paul for the reasons that Paul gave, for having loved this present world, then do we not also understand that not only did Demas forsake Paul, he also forsook the Lord. That he also, when he departed into Thessalonica, he did not just only leave Paul, but he also left Christ. So we see Demas is an example of one who was a Christian, and yet he departed the Lord because of his obvious too much love for this present world. And then it's possible for us to have too much emphasis in the wrong places. In Colossians chapter 3, remember in chapter 2, it we're told, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. As I said a moment ago, there are things of this earth that we have to devote attention, that we have to devote time to. There's no way that we can get through this life and then the relationships of life that we're in, whether as a husband and a wife or children, or an employer, an employee, these are things that, that has to have certain amounts of time devoted to them. But at the same time, what we're saying is that there is a setting of our mind that we can set upon the wrong things. Not that there are things that are wrong in themselves, it's just that we've set our minds there. That's where most of our focus, most of our attention is devoted. So what this verse is saying, we need to set our minds on things that are above. And certainly give proper attention to the things of this life that are necessary. Peter made a statement too. In First Peter chapter 3, he said in verse 3 and 4, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, 
arranging the hair wearing gold or put it on fine apparel. Latter, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. See, this is an example of too much emphasis in the wrong places. There is an emphasis that we certainly is not condemning the arranging of the hair. Many of us, with few exceptions, <laughs> have to arrange our hair every day. So we, we must do that. That's something that we have to devote to. There's certainly nothing wrong with the wearing of gold, or else we would have to remove our rings that are off of our hands if we were to say that that's what the verse is saying. Or even for that matter, the putting on of apparel, fine apparel. No, this is just simply Peter saying that this is not where the real physical concerns need to be, not the outward adornment. We need to be concerned with that. But the most important is the hidden person of the heart, that which he says is incorruptible. You know, there are too many Christians that are caught in the three kinds of thorns that we find mentioned of in the passage we read in Mark 4, verses 18, and also particularly verse 19. And that's what we want to focus our study on. One of those thorns is the cares of this world. That's what verse 19 tells us. These are cares that are a part of life, can be, but they become to where they are distracted. To us. These are, if we're not careful, the cares that we become preoccupied with. And as a result, these are the things that we allow to hinder our spiritual growth, our spiritual service unto God. Our minds, our schedules, they're just simply filled with things of this life till it becomes that there's just no room or very little room for spiritual matters. We can become too concerned about making a living. Over in Matthew chapter 6, let's read verse 25, where Jesus begins and says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by wearying can add one cubit to his statue? Or why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the heaven, will he not much more clothe you, O you, of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, what we shall eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear. For after all of these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. So we see that we can have too much concern as Jesus is pointing out here, concerning just the things that are involved in making a living that we all have to do. That is certainly a responsibility that God has given us to. And there can be too much concern too for the future because notice what the very next verse there in Matthew 6 says. In verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. 
sufficient for today is its own trouble. Many people concern themselves about tomorrow, and too much concern can certainly constitute this cares of the world that Jesus describes as a thorn. And two, there can be, I guess for the lack of <laughs> saying it in other way, is that we major in manners. And about the best example I think I see of that is in Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary had chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Mary was not a, Martha rather was not a wicked woman. She was not a vile woman. She was not a woman that, that would, you would have wanted to have shunned and not been around. In, in all respects, the exact opposite of that. But yet what we see here is that while the things of her household were important, and yes, she did have a guest, and that put a certain obligation upon her. Still, as Jesus was there, and in those times in which he was teaching, that needed to be the most important thing. And that's what Jesus points out, that Mary had chosen over what Martha was doing. So the cares of this world, too much concerned about making a living, too much concern about the future, and too much of this majoring in minors truly qualifies and fits into this category of what Jesus is referring to. But also verse 19 of Mark chapter 4 gives us yet another of the thorns that can choke us. He says the deceitfulness of riches. You know, the possessions of riches can sort of create within us, if we're not careful, a false concept, a false understanding, a false sense of security. In Luke chapter 12, we have, beginning with verse 15, this parable that Jesus spoke. He said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Then he spake a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will all these things be you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If you have your Bibles open, go back and look at those verses. I think what you'll find in what we've just read is that I is found some six times in those verses. And my is found some five times in what we've read. I and my. You know what that translates to? It translates to me. And that's really what this parable is, is about. It's showing how that we can allow our possessions to allure us into this feeling 
of security. When the truth in the matter is that as uncertain as our riches are, is as uncertain as our security will be. You know, the pursuit of riches, it's very possible, and this so often happens, the pursuit, the pursuing of riches oftentimes causes a person to change in their attitude and in their thinking about things that are more, things that are of spiritual value. Sometimes people that would have been dead set against gambling in their pursuit of getting more change their views about the lottery and other forms of gambling. And it just made it to them all of a sudden, not just all of a sudden, but over a period of time, just be considered as some innocent pastime to them. You know, in Luke chapter 15, we have been looking at Luke chapter 15 quite a bit in the radio program, looking at the so many lessons that are to be had concerning the prodigal son. But it's that in Luke 15 and verse 3, that it said, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed into a far country, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. I think the King James says, riotous living. So, certainly, we can see that attitudes can change in our pursuit. And two, we're told in Titus, in Titus chapter 2, in verse 10, notice it said, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Not pilfering. You know, the, the pursuit that some people have for riches, and we need to be careful that we do not fall into the same category, is that we pilfer maybe from an employer. And we do that having a mind satisfied, justified, on the basis that, well, you know, he's not paying me what he should, or he's overworking me, he's working me too hard. And so, you know, I'm just collecting what's due here. See how attitudes can change and what changes it? A pursuit of riches, the deceitfulness of riches. Two, I think another thing that falls under the deceitfulness of riches is withholding all or withholding part of what is due to others can also may be turned into what we think is, well, it's just good management. Well, James talked about withholding wages. In James chapter 2, I'm sorry, James chapter 5 and verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reaped the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So the word Sabaoth here, by the way, is not Sabbath, it's Sabaoth, and that just simply is a word that is in other parts of the scriptures translated as host, the Lord of hosts. So these are things that, yes, they are seen, they are recognized by God, and we don't need to think that it's just a trivial man to withhold that which is due to someone else. And also, we see, too, that we can withhold from family members. That, too, is a part or can be a result of the deceitfulness of riches. In Matthew chapter 15, here's what we read beginning with verse 4. That for God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he that curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might receive from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father and mother. 
Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. It would be what we would consider a simple command, honor your father and mother. To return, to repay, to requite the things to your parents that when you were in a position that you were not able to care and take care of yourself, they were there, they took care of you, they nurtured you. And now sometimes, as the old expression goes, once the man, twice the child. In our older years, we can revert back to where there are things that we can no longer do for ourselves. So the honoring of parents is, is a command that's been handed down all the way through the Old Testament scriptures and still is a part of our responsibility. But here we see how that command would be in sidestep. All because they wanted to keep what they had, keep what they had to themselves, and not give to their parents that would have resulted in their honor. And so Jesus says, you've made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. In First Timothy, we're told in chapter 5, and the 8th verse, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. When we withhold from even our family members, we are engaging in the deceitfulness of riches that is truly nothing but a thorn and will do nothing in regards to helping us to be a spiritual person that we ought to be. And two, just think about it. Withholding that which we're to lay by in store that we'll be doing in just a few moments. Remember the problem in Israel's day, especially during the days of uh, Malachi in chapter 3. He said in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? He said, In tithes and offerings. Now I know we don't pay tithes. And I know that we don't make offerings in the sense in which that we're studying and uh, familiar with in the Old Testament. But many of the things that the Old Testament were types and shadows, were they not? Are we today still commanded to give to the Lord? Yes. First Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as God has prospered. No, we don't have a specific amount, a specific percentage, like tithes, but we are to give as we have been prospered. Now, if our giving is either not at all, or if our giving is not in accord to our being prospered, are we not doing the same thing that Israel did in the days of Malachi, robbing God? And to ask the question, well, how are we robbing you? We are robbing him by not giving as we've been prospered. And what lays at the root of that? The deceitfulness of riches. Keeping it to ourselves, for ourselves. But then there's a third thorn that Jesus makes mention in Mark chapter 4, verse 19. He says, the desire for others things. Well, what would that include? Or what could that include? Well, it could include the desire for pleasure. And the reason I know that is because in the parallel that we have of this same parable of the sower, we read about it in Luke chapter 8. He says in verse 14, same parable, same explanation. Jesus said, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So as Mark records, the desire for other things, then I truly see that the desire for pleasure, the desire for fun, is specifically mentioned 
in the parallel. We all desire pleasure. We all want pleasure. We all enjoy pleasure. There's a place for it, yes. But think about it. Think about our hobbies, the things that really interest us. You know, I'm a ham radio operator. Well, a lot of ham fest where you can go and see other hams. You can go and, and see equipment that somebody may have for sale at a pretty good price. Guess what? Most of those ham fests are on Sunday. And they're pretty good distances away, at least from where I lived in Virginia, not any major cities close by. Well, you know, I could allow that hobby to let me miss services on Lord's Day. In order to go, I mean, just, you know, once, twice a year, maybe three times a year to go to one of those ham fairs. As most of you know, I, I like classical cars. I've got one. Well, a lot of car shows, those are interesting. They have an in, I have an interest in them. But again, <laughs> most car shows are on the weekends. And I still enjoy my car. I still enjoy my ham radio. But there's certain aspects of my hobby that I need to put in this place because they interfere with things that are of a spiritual nature. And I'm just saying these things to see how that hopefully you can take whatever your interest is and determine if you have a place for it that you know it rightfully can occupy, but then there's also maybe a place that will interfere and it does interfere with you as a Christian and just Maybe the sole matter of being able to attend faithfully. Well, these are things that could be the desire for other things that Jesus talks about that chokes us. And not just only it applies for hobbies, but the same thing applies for sports. So many of the sports is on weekends, Wednesday nights, things of that nature. And there's a place for sports, certainly. But we need to give them the proper place, but yet at the same time, give God his proper place. Not put our hobbies, our sports, our interests over our spiritual responsibilities. Some people love fun and pleasure so much they try to bring it into the religion that they profess. In... Exodus, the children of Israel did that. In Exodus 32 and verse 6, Then they rose early on the next day, offered their burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. And that's the thing that so many in so many places are doing. Their desire for pleasure, their desire for fun, is something that they cannot give place to, but they've got to make it a thing that involves every aspect of their lives. And there's a place for fun. There's a place for pleasure. But when it comes to worshiping God, when it comes to doing the things that God commands of us for Him, then we cannot add our ingredients to make it pleasurable, to make it fun, to, just for the sake of keeping it interested, for the sake that we don't get bored. We need to take the light. We need to take happiness in serving God. Did not David say that he was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord? So there needs to be a kind of gladness that we need to have on these spiritual things. It's not going to compare to the gladness that we're going to have going to play volleyball or to go outside and the building during the services and, and conduct as many places do vacation Bible schools that includes all kinds of sports and fun activities. No, we need to let this desire for pleasure have its place and not over our spiritual responsibilities. And two, this desire for other things. That would also include the desire that all of us have to a certain degree, 
And that is the desire for popularity, the desire for acceptance. Jesus said in John 12, verse 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You know, but Davis mentioned this in the Bible study this morning. Many people believed in Christ, but yet because of the positions that they were in, they did not want to confess Christ or they did not want to acknowledge that Christ was who he was because of fear that that would put them out with other people that they associated with on a daily basis, whether it was scribes or Pharisees or chief priests or whatever. And two, this desire for other things, would that not include the desire for power, the desire for preeminence? In Matthew 18, Jesus said in verse 1, at that, desire, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, when you talk about desire for popularity, you talk about desire for preeminence, even. This can cause us to compromise the truth. It can cause us to change our positions on certain subjects of spiritual significance. And it can cause us, put us in a position where that we fail to rebuke and to reprove others. Why? Because we want to be popular. We want to be accepted by others. So these are the three thorns that Jesus talks about. The cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. I believe that there are more individuals, more Christians, that are choked to death by the thorns of what I said a moment ago, respectable worldliness, than by just out and out worldliness. I don't think we have as Christians much of a problem with fornication, adultery, drunkenness, things of that nature. But we must set our minds on things above. That's where we, are, we hear that word mindset. Well, the scriptures use it. Let us have our mindset on the things above. We're, we're told that explicitly in Colossians chapter 3, when he says in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And then notice the next verse. For you die. But I'm still living. You're still living. What does he mean? For you died. Well, we were to have put to death, were we not, the desires of the flesh. Is not the condition that we had before we become a Christian referred to as the old man? And what do the scriptures describe as the condition of one who has obeyed the gospel and has their sins forgiven? The new man, a new creature. Why? Because we have crucified, we put to death these things. And so therefore Paul says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So let us set our minds on things above, not on things of the earth. If you're here and you're a Christian, are there thorns in your life? Are there things that you recognize as cares of the world that are choking you? Or maybe there are those things that are pertaining to money, things, possessions, that you see 
is truly a thorn to you. Or maybe there are these others, otherwise innocent things of this life, but yet the desire for them is beyond what they need to be. Be it pleasure, be it popularity, or be it preeminence. Let's all be honest with ourselves. And know that while we must live in this world, there is a place that the world has to be given. But never let that place take precedence over our being a Christian. Let's truly be what we profess to be, a child of God. And in all things, putting him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things, what we wear, what we eat, the things of this life will take care of themselves. You need to repent of your sins. You need to repent publicly. Make that confession, acknowledgement of sin. Then certainly do so. Now, before we leave the building, if we need to pray with you and for you, we will be most glad to do that. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. Maybe you need to hear the word, believe it, repent of your sins, confess with your mouth that Christ is the Son of God. The Baptist was ready for us to immerse you, to bury you with Christ in baptism. It will result in the forgiveness of your sins. Then you are dead. Dead from dead in sin, dead from sin, but you are alive under Christ. Now seek those things that are above. If we can assist you in either of these ends, please let it be known. While together we stand the same. Well,